Okay, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to speak today. So the themes for today, as you know, are Latin America and the global anti-imperialist struggle. I am speaking, as Nina has said, on behalf of Friends of Socialist China. So what I'd like to talk about is the relationship between China and Latin America, and specifically uh, the accusations, uh, slanders, I might say, that are leveled by certain imperialist politicians and echoed in the media, and uh, you know, unfortunately among parts of the left as well, that China is a neo-colonial or an imperialist force in relation to Latin America. These accusations have been repeated so often, so vehemently, that they've acquired the force of an accepted truth. Every US government over the last 20 plus years, where there have been growing, rising economic, political, diplomatic links between China and progressive Latin America, has sought to sabotage those ties. Um, has sought to sabotage the ties between Beijing and the region that the US considers to be its backyard, or perhaps in the era of Biden, it might have been upgraded to a front yard, but a yard all the same. And their favorite line of attack is approximately, you've got to be careful of those Chinese because they're imperialists. We were the old imperialists, we know that, but they're the new imperialists. You know, the Secretary of State under Obama, Hillary Clinton, said this, that China is a neo-colonial force. Rex Tillerson, the Secretary of State under Trump, said this, China's a neo-colonial force. Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State under Biden, follows the same line. Clearly, we need a frame of reference. What does modern imperialism actually look like in Latin America? Have we got any examples of a foreign power imposing political and economic domination on the countries of the region? Well, actually, yes, there are a few examples. Um, if we look at the post-World War II history, we can talk about, for example, 1954 and the CIA-backed overthrow of the progressive, popular, democratic government of Jacobo Arbenz in Guatemala. We can look at 1961, the Playa Giron, the, the Bay of Pigs invasion, when the CIA trained armed, financed, and even c conveyed, you know, even um, transported Cuban exiles in their fade, failed attempt to overthrow the revolutionary government in Havana. We could talk about the US support for the vicious military coup in Brazil in 1964, and their support, their consistent support, and their prominent support for the military dictatorship that took the place of the Gulag government and ruled Brazil under an iron fist for the following two decades. Um, you know, the US was also deeply involved in the process of undermining and destabilizing the Allende-led popular unity government in Chile between 1970 and 1973. Henry Kissinger famously said that we need to make the Chilean economy scream. We need to make the Chilean people suffer so that they get rid of this progressive, this Marxist, this socialist experiment. The CIA was involved in the military coup that removed that government, and the US came to be a top supporter of the Pinochet dictatorship. Indeed, Chile in the 1970s and 1980s was the site of the first early experiments with neoliberal economics while Pinochet's militia were murdering and repressing and torturing communists, socialists, trade unions, Democrats, and indigenous peoples, the so-called Chicago Boys group of economists, along with the likes of Milton Friedman, were given free reign to organize the Chilean economy along the lines of free market fundamentalism. The US was the primary motive force behind the Contra War in Nicaragua in the 1980s, a brutal decade-long uh, war of regime change to punish the people of Nicaragua for choosing the path of socialism, for choosing the path of independence and sovereignty. That war would never have taken place were it not for the backing of the CIA, were it not for the backing of the White House, were it not for the backing of the State Department. And, you know, it's an aside, but the Contra War was financed in no small part by cocaine trafficking on the part of the Contra rebels and actively facilitated 
by the CIA. You can draw a direct line. <laughs> you can draw a direct line between the war of regime change in Nicaragua and the crack cocaine epidemic on the streets of Los Angeles and New York City. But you know, maybe that's all ancient history. We've only got as far as the late 1980s, right? So perhaps the imperialist leopard has changed its spots. Unfortunately not. Uh, in April 2002, for example, the US was involved in an attempted coup against the government of Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. And it has consistently, over the course of more than 20 years now, attempted to destabilize Venezuela and punish the, Venezuela, uh, the Venezuelan people for choosing their path of the Bolivarian Revolution. The US was behind a coup in Honduras in 2009 that removed the government of Manuel Zelaya. In Brazil in 2016, the US provided explicit backing and implicit backing to the lawfare coup that removed the government of Dilma Rousseff and paved the way for four years of quasi-fascism under Jair Bolsonaro. The US, as you know, is up to its neck in subversion and destabilization against Sandinista Nicaragua today. It applies illegal unilateral sanctions against Cuba, against Venezuela, against Nicaragua. The US has never given up on, on the idea of using economic suffocation, of using a criminal blockade which is rejected by the entire world to try and foment counter-revolution in, in Cuba. They've been trying for more than 60 years. You know, Albert Einstein famously said, or purportedly said, that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and thinking it's going to work out differently. Well, my friends, the ruling class is insane. The US has 76 military bases in Latin America and the Caribbean. It uses sanctions, destabilization, economic coercion, coups, and propaganda in order to buttress its hegemony, in order to create a favorable business environment, in order to ensure its domination of the region's land, its economic resources, its natural resources, its labor, and its markets. So, you know, I think it's fair to say we know what imperialism looks like in Latin America. So the next question is, does China's involvement in the region look like that? Um, well, for one thing, China has precisely zero military bases in Latin America and the Caribbean. It has sponsored no coups, waged no wars, imposes no sanctions, is involved in no campaigns of destabilization, no propaganda wars, no economic coercion. Whereas the US uses every trick in the book to try and subvert and attack the progressive and socialist countries in the region, China has excellent relations with those countries. It has a relationship of friendship and solidarity. <laughs> now, what China does a lot of in Latin America and the Caribbean is trade and investment. You know, bilateral trade since the turn of the century has increased by a factor of 40. Uh, direct investment from China has increased by a factor of five. And of the 33 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, 21 are signed up to China's Belt and Road Initiative. <laughs> Is that imperialism? Well, the countries of the region don't seem to think so. China's very purposefully, very specifically, helping other countries of the global south to break out of underdevelopment, to break out of the underdevelopment which the colonial countries and the imperialist countries have been holding the region in for 500 years. <laughs> Chinese investment is building schools, it's building hospitals, it's building railways, it's building ports, it's building energy infrastructure, it's building telecommunications infrastructure. This means creating a situation where the countries of the region can modernize.
they can develop their productive forces, they can meet the needs of their people, and they can do that without having to give up their sovereignty, without having to accept the permanent position at the bottom of the global economic hierarchy that the US has assigned to them and reserved for them. For example, China provided the technology for Bolivia, which is a small and very poor country, to launch its first satellite, which now provides internet and phone connection to the whole country. China invested in the project, it provided the finance, it provided the technological know-how, the scientific know-how, um, but the satellite belongs to Bolivia. The Bioceanic Railway, which was conceived of jointly by Xi Jinping and Evo Morales, will run from the Pacific coast of Peru through landlocked Bolivia to the Atlantic coast of central Brazil. So it's a project that's not just contributing to economic development, but continent-wide integration. China's support and solidarity has been essential in the fight against COVID-19. Of all the vaccine doses that have been administered in Latin America and the Caribbean, more than 50% have been from China. Actually, I was in this very hall two years ago when Luis Arce, the, um, the president of Bolivia, was giving a speech and he was addressing the Bolivian community and a few friends. And he said, you know, in Bolivia, it's a poor country. The majority of the workforce works in the casual sector, um, in the informal sector. So you can't tell these people, well, you're locked down, you're going to have to work from home. You can't sell bananas from, from your home. Um, so to get our country moving again, vaccines were absolutely essential. We went to the United States, they gave us nothing. We went to Europe, they gave us nothing. Who knocked on our door? Who asked us, do you need our help? It was China, it was Russia, and it was Cuba. What do Latin Americans think? What does the revolutionary leadership of the peoples of Latin America think? Well, Hugo Chavez, who obviously we're honoring today, was certainly a great friend of China. He visited China six times during his presidency. He said about Chinese socialism, we've been manipulated to believe that the first man on the moon was the most important event of the 20th century. But no, much more important things happened. And one of the greatest events of the century was the Chinese Revolution. Chavez talked about an alliance between progressive Latin America and China as being a great wall against American hegemonism. He said, China's large, but it's not an empire. China's large, but it's not an empire. China doesn't trample on anyone. It hasn't invaded anyone. It doesn't go around dropping bombs on anyone. Um, Fidel Castro is another person that probably knew quite well what imperialism looks like since he spent his entire life dedicated to fighting against it. Fidel said that China has objectively become the most promising hope and the best example for all third world countries, an important element of balance, progress and safeguarding of world peace and stability. And And China's friendship has been extremely important to Cuba. The two countries are cooperating on numerous projects, including in the biomedical sphere and including in the renewable energy sphere. And while the US imposes its criminal blockade, China extends the, friend, the hand of friendship, assistance, and solidarity, including most recently giving a donation of $100 million, no strings attached, to help Cuba recover from a series of natural disasters. So these accusations of Chinese imperialism in Latin America don't stick. They've got no basis in reality. But why do they exist? Why do we hear them so often? And not just from the imperialists, but also tragically from sections of the left. They exist because the US, the US ruling class and its allies want to break the unity of the socialist countries, the progressive countries, all those countries that refuse to go along with the so-called rules-based international order. Which, that rules-based international order, which we all know is a code name for a brutal, oppressive, racist, exploitative, US-led imperialist world system.
They want to break the inexorable trajectory of the world towards multipolarity. The idea of the countries such as China, Cuba, Venezuela, Bolivia, Brazil, Nicaragua, Russia, Iran, Zimbabwe, Belarus, South Africa, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Vietnam, North Korea, all working together, all uniting, building a project of solidarity, what Xi Jinping has referred to as a community with a shared future for humanity, that's something that scares the living daylights out of these scoundrels. And that is all the more reason that we should carry on supporting it and building it. Thank you very much. I think I need to bring back the... <laughs> Thank you, Carlos, for this fantastic expose of hypocrisy, of lies, of the face of democracy, and a reminder of the global south, the majority of the people, us, and our analysis on China, our analysis on what's happening uh, in Latin America, and whether this label of imperialism stands when you apply it to these countries. It's ridiculous. Um, I'm going to now um, have the pleasure of inviting an independent journalist who has worked in um, the independent republics, now independent republics of Donbass. There is nothing that scares the, the fascists more than seeing the flag of these independent republics. We had uh, um, a comrade being attacked by these Ukrainian thugs who have every sense of, you know, liberty to walk in the streets of London because of how they have been treated and sponsored by British imperialism, of course. They tried to attack our comrade who was holding the flag, and they also tried to deplatform Dean O'Brien um, at an event where he was trying to talk, to share his experiences of being in Donbass, and this is where we met him. They didn't manage to deplatform him. And now he's here, he's free, in the house of the people, as uh, the Venezuelan ambassador said, to talk to us. Please, Dino Bryan. We're going to have a very uh, brief uh, uh, introduction to the program. Before I allow you to hear Dean speak, we're all fascinated to hear what Dean's got to say. The propaganda about the Ukraine war has been the dominant feature of our lives for the last year. It's impossible to hide from it. It's impossible to hide from the false message that imperialism gives. And you can see we here in this hall are few. It's a well-attended meeting, but we are few. But we need to keep our movement going so that this message can be heard far and wide. And I'd like to ask you, in order to hear Dean, just please to dig your hands into your pockets. I'm gonna ask Mike and Lucy and Colin, if you wouldn't mind just to take the hat around we haven't charged anything for admission to the meeting, but we'd very much like your financial support for our work to keep this message going, to support our anti-imperialist work. So please, comrades, if you take a couple of minutes before hearing Dean and seeing his, as you can see, wonderful first-hand report from the Donbass, from the front line, where since 2014, the people have been struggling against Ukrainian fascism, the puppet of US imperialism, and this proxy war that is going on now to further uh, push the agenda of NATO imperialism. Please put your hand into your pockets, give generously. We welcome any contribution, but please, you know, all these pundits who are coming onto the internet saying, buy me a coffee, go to my Patreon, just give me 10 pounds a month. Your money is better spent at home on your building this anti-imperialist movement, so please, I would invite any of you who are not involved, who haven't signed up on the door, who haven't visited our literature store, to do so. But please do dig deep now and show your support financially and help us to build this movement. Thank you. Give yourself a round of applause for doing so while the hat goes round. Thank you. Dean, I'm just going to give that to you, mate. And then very shortly we'll get going. Is that all right? No worries. No worries, mate.